We are live. We are live. This is Senate Finance, Tuesday, February 20th. And we're going to start today uh, with S-181, an act relating to the Community Media Public Benefits Fund. This was the proposal for uh, the poll tax. I believe, Laurie Glenn, we're looking at some kind of an excise tax on the streaming services. We're just trying to get an idea from you is what is your budget? What, how much money do we need to raise? Thank you, Senator. For the record, I'm Lauren Glendavidian. I'm Public Policy Director for CCTV Center for Media and Democracy. And I represent Vermont Access Network, 24 community media centers toiling ceaselessly to keep the wheels of democracy turning and community media education and local history preserved across the state. I understand that you have been discussing S181, which we deeply appreciate, and have some questions in particular about what the revenue gap is that we are trying to solve. Um, I have provided some additional information by way of written testimony, but I could get right to the point of the question that you were asking. So the um, Community Media Public Benefit Fund, just the first point I wanna make is that the poll attachment uh, excise tax was identified to be the revenue source that um, fit the bill legally. It it created, um, it, it, the legislature has the legal authority to um, exercise this excise tax. And it also creates um, some flexibility for um, its assessment on the internet side and it exempts the CUDs and it also provides for the cable companies not being assessed twice. So to the extent that they are paying into the franchise fee, what we call in Vermont, um, they would not be assessed the excise tax until the excise tax becomes more than the franchise fee. So we have looked at the trends of cable TV revenue across the country, which are anticipated to, to, to decline dramatically. In Vermont, the decline has been slower for a variety of reasons, which may have to do with broadband build out in the rural areas and rate increases. So we've seen um, a, a decrease in revenue of I would say between one and 3% over the past couple of years. And we're projecting that that revenue will be flat or decline possibly by 1%, which is very conservative estimate based on what the national numbers are showing in terms of cable cord cutting. We've also identified that the expenses of the community media centers, um, we've created projections based on inflate rate of inflation. And so in the memo, you can see the data of what the actual rates of inflation are. So long story short, as between now and 2030, um, between 2024 and 2030, the community media centers would benefit from about $3 million a year. And that is an average of what the revenue gap is between now and 2030. Is it $3 million all told, or $3 million a piece for the 24? All told, for the 24. Okay. Yes. Okay. And so there are there's a chart that shows the financial projections. There's a, um, a table that shows the trends. It, we see that we'll have about a $1.6 million gap in 2024, and about a $4.6 million gap in 2030. But if you average that out, the simple answer would be $3 million a year. Okay. It adds up to $3 million a year if you divide it, add it, and divide it. Yeah. Oh, that's, so that's a much lower number than we were getting for the poll tax. And I yes. I think there's a couple concerns. One, we had some legal opinions that said we might be under federal, uh, we might be in conflict with federal law. Two, um, I'm afraid that once we start attaching coal fees, that that could become the uh, you know the thing to do when you want to raise some more revenue, and that would end up raising the cost of the internet, which we don't want to do. And so you can do it. You're losing your money because people aren't getting cable TV; they're streaming. So that seems like a logical 
uh, way to go. We're still waiting to find out if we can do it uh, because we have to check the streamlined sales tax, but uh, we're going to send you chip. Lauren, thank you for your testimony, and I'm reading over your document. One thing that I'm not seeing in here, which I think Senator Rom Hinsdale raised in our last discussion, please correct me, Senator Rom Hinsdale, if I'm misstating this, but uh, do you have any historical revenue uh, for, uh, uh, estimates or actuals uh, for from the cable franchise fee going back 20 to 30 years? I think what was raised was the concern that people are cutting the cord is decreasing that revenue stream. And if anything, we wanted to try to fill that hole by looking at a streaming tax to try to connect that deficit with something else. Do you, do you have the historical revenues collected from the cable franchise fee fees to share? Yes. And in fact, these projections in chart the first chart are based on those numbers. So we've taken, yes. So the short answer is yes, we have the historic numbers on um, cable revenue. Cable revenue has risen steadily over the past 10 years, but the rate of increase has declined, right? So I, I certainly can show you the numbers that we have, but what you see in that chart, which is the PEG financial projections, is a trend line while it's not going down precipitously quickly it's going it's flattening in burlington we've had you know 19 percent decline just in revenue forget how our expenses have increased over the past five or six years and in a place like brattleboro you haven't seen as a precipitous a decline in revenue right but taken as a whole you see that the revenue is is um is is declining slowly right. in Vermont. Expenses are going up a lot yeah. higher than they used to. So what's driving that? Yeah, so the rate, if you just take the rate of inflation, number one, just straight up rate of inflation as a proxy for increased expenses. Um, our labor costs obviously have increased over the past couple of years, as you can imagine, everyone's has. And then we've also expanded our services uh, to the communities that we serve now. So we've we've created this pivot to hybrid meetings, which actually, interestingly enough, require more people than just bringing in a camera. And we're also serving uncabled areas in different parts of the state, which was a question that's also come up, which is why should internet subscribers who aren't getting, who aren't in a cable service territory, are, what kind of service are they going to get for the money that you're asking them to pay? And so there's two answers to that. One is that we are actually already serving parts of the state that are not necessarily in cable territories, and that's in the memo. And also, we're willing to expand service if we are able to generate this fund to parts of the state that are not currently being served. Can I just clarify my uh, the concern I raised? I think I'm glad Senator Chinden raised it somewhat, but I want to clarify that I fully support the services that are provided mm -hmm. by public access. Um, and my concern was more that it be a uh, an equitable ratio of tax to payment made for the service yeah. so that regardless of how much we're trying to raise, that at the end of the day, cable subscribers and streaming subscribers are paying the same tax rate on the amount that they pay. Um, so I just, you know, if we have to raise both, we raise both, but I just wanted to make sure that it's, it's, there's parity there. Um, and, you know, I would say that if we are taxing streaming providers, that we should be including something about expanding service areas or, and or, you know, creating more of an internet portal to access um, all of the statewide public access programs. I just feel strongly that it, this should help leap to what people are actually doing, <laughs> um, you know, which is looking on their phones and wanting content organized on a mobile platform that helps them plug into different meetings around the state. It's within your realm to set a 5% um, 
threshold as a policy question. So I also included in the memo what Massachusetts and New York are doing. Neither um, Massachusetts or New York, or New York in particular, doesn't yet collect a streaming tax. So this is new money for them. But they've modeled it on Massachusetts, which is a 5% of streaming, if that's the way that you choose to go. So there is a limit that's built into those two bills. And that could be of interest. And also, um, Senator Rom Hinsdale, you did mention this at the last meeting, and I've also included examples of how content is being distributed by community media centers. So there are several of them that are using the online platforms like Roku or have apps that you can um, access content on the phone. And also we have a statewide TV channel for the Comcast in the Comcast service territories, but it's also available online that runs programs of statewide interest. And then you're going to find just as a PS, there are um, regional sporting events, regional school district meetings that are covered that may not just that are not just confined to cable service territories. So we've been working to expand our service for a long time. And the distribution options, as you've described so well, we have been working on that as well. Okay. Patient, do you have any other questions? Not necessarily. I just, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the documents in front of me. I think this is going to ultimately be a JFO question. But I just hope I'm making myself clear that I just want to see the percent charged per unit of consumption and have it be equal between cable and streaming. <clears throat> and yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, you might get, I'm, I think I understand what you're asking. I don't know if anyone would have those statistics, but I'll leave it to you to find out. Uh, we've only got about a week to get, we've got two bills, I think, still to get out. Uh, and then we've got a few coming our way, like the housing bill. So that's any, fine. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Lauren. That you, you have something? Could I just ask one question? Sure. If you don't mind, I know you weren't directing that to me, but um, if the streaming option proves not to be viable because of the streamlined tax code, yeah. are you, is there strong opposition to the idea of the poll attachment excise tax? Would that be something you would consider or is, have? I think we're, we're hopeful that the streaming will be viable. And if it's not, then we're back to square one, but, and yours is the only offer on the table. So uh, I don't think we've ruled it out. I think there was concern about what we, about the legality and about just setting the precedent of putting poll tax on. Uh, Great. I'm yep. first concerned because I was here when we put $2 for this good program on a traffic ticket, and it got up to where it was two to $300, and we forced people not to be able to pay that traffic ticket. And I don't want to do that with broadband. Um, Understood. I remember that you did say that. And then um, also remember Maria um, at Ledge Council had, had given you the green light on the legality of the whole attachment excise tax. So if, if this one doesn't work out, we're back to, to the Okay. So got a week to do it. So we thank you so much for your consideration, all members of the committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Committee, we've got Kirby coming in. No, not till tomorrow. A um, couple things. Lauren Hibbert was is coming in, but she's tied up in a probes. Um, I just asked her to come in. As you remember, Friday, there was Pro Tem came in and, and message and wanted to do some amendments to uh, 850. Um, 
talked to various people around here and then talked to Lauren. And it was one of those messages that got just kind of conflated in the middle. And the bottom line was they had just like two words that would tighten it up, but it's not necessary and not worth slowing the bill down for. So I know the pro tem said they could do something with probes. It was out of here, but I wanted to let you know that that was there and I asked Lauren to come in and tell you. Um, the other thing that I need to tell you is we sent out the, um, the uh, broadband bill, mergers and acquisitions and uh, the chair of GovOps and I had said right along, we were not going to deal with the public me meeting law in that because that's not what we do. And I assumed it would go to her. She says, it isn't, um, she just wanted us to know she's going to stand up and ask that that whole public meeting section be deleted because she, her committee is doing a whole, uh, a unified public records clarity bill and the whole CUD issue will be covered in there. So that's what's going on unless someone... Which section is that? That was the last section in the bill. And it basically said that all of their meetings, everything was not an open meeting. And I believe in the new bill, they will not be an open meeting law. Is that what I was told? Well, I think we can get to the same place, but she doesn't feel a need to take in the bill because she's going to do another bill. Well, I had a discussion uh, this, this morning. Uh, what, she, what she indicated was a concern that individual bills are floating around that have different uh, open records uh, requirements and rules, and that creates confusion. And her goal, and the goal of the committee, was to get uniform relative to uh, how we deal with open, open, open record issues, which structurally is not unreasonable. Yeah, I, we have a lot of times <clears throat> where each committee does something, and then you get a law that had so many attachments, it ends up in court trying to figure out what it means. It looks like the public education bill. Yeah, and so yeah. So we, uh, that's what's going to happen um, if it happens on the floor. That's fine. Unless somebody objects, I will say it's fine. It's uh, sorry, I got pulled out of the title, but I just want to clarify. So I'm looking at S199 now, and we're talking about just Section 3, the organizational meetings, remote meetings. Yeah. But then the other sections about the treasurer, are those? Right. Okay, so yeah. just Section uh, Everything we've put in there, we didn't take anything on open meetings because I don't know anything about open meetings laws yeah. because we don't do it in here. Um, next, in 10 minutes, I'm going to invite you to my world because I've spent the last two weekends and most nights answering emails from the town of Stowe. Um, I've got one or two from others, but we are looking at a 20% property tax increase, which is... I don't think unsustainable because that'll be your new base. And so I have, I'm trying to get um, superintendents in here. Libby Bone Steel from Montpelier is coming. We're looking at a 24% increase, and that's after the 10 cent credit that 850 is going to give them. So we are looking at a 24% increase in spending. Stowe is, I think they're down to 19%. That's um, that's Caledonia Central Union. No, Cal, that's Memorial Supervisory. Memorial. So their superintendent is coming in today. Jim Murphy, who's the school board chair of Montpelier, is coming. And then we have Mark Tucker from Caledonia Central. They seem to be holding in there at about a 10% increase, which we would consider a godsend today. So I'm going to try and see what is going on in the different districts. Uh, they're all losing estimates. They're all losing, um, they've all seen a 16.45% in their health insurance. And we're going to have the health insurance people in too. And 
uh, they're all looking at new labor contracts given seven percent inflation. So those pressures are are standing. We also are starting. There, there's a survey out, but we know some districts are considering the ESSER funds in last year's base. So if you look at what they're spending, it's only going up from last year's base, but that base includes a whole bunch of one-time money. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we, we get that. And the other one is it's not actual <clears throat> spending of the budget, but also what you're uh, spending per pupil because you can have a very small increase this year, but if you're, you know, you're spending fifty thousand dollars per pupil, you're pretty expensive. So, I think um, we are not taking money from schools and giving it to Winooski. I've been accused of that. We are not. Um, the new the weights hadn't been changed. I, Brendy, were you on the waiting? Yeah, I know. They, had, they hadn't been looked at since the 70s, right? When they it, were. It was a little long. I don't remember exactly when. But it was decades. Yeah, it was it, it was long. Yeah. And, and the issue was that what was being done was, was simply not equitable. And you know, enough examples. And of course, we used uh, UVM and uh, another outside uh, group to actually do the some very detailed study. And there's a lot of study and detail behind what was actually done and why. Uh, and we obviously argued about it a, a lot, but there were things like uh, English as a second language in which uh, you had just wildly different uh, amounts being spent for that. And in some cases, and particularly in smaller communities in the kingdom, uh, it was just it was just simply obviously inequitable. Yeah. Uh, and so that was just designed to be corrected uh, there, there are other things like, you know, is poverty uh, something that, that ought to be weighted? Is morality the something morality that ought to be weighted? And the conclusions in the academic evidence seem to suggest that uh, there were impacts that they could, could demonstrate. Uh, one of the, the real questions that I, I still have, and I need to look at the, the detail in, in, in a little bit more detail, is, is the real cause or a major part of the cause of this not... The, the equity issue, aside from the 5% mm -hmm. cap issue, is it really just simply a cost, higher labor costs and higher spending uh, yeah. by the school board, largely on labor and on health care? Those are the big numbers. Senator Chibley, you had the complaint about shares. Would you like to go to the sergeant at arms office and tell him we have the most uncomfortable chairs in the state house and we have lost several? I don't you know. You know. You can email her, but we need. Oh, you want to go down and tell them? We don't have enough chairs. I was just relaying a complaint. I wasn't lying. I told you <laughs> that's the only thing I can do is ask the sergeant at arms. I have no control over the chairs. We don't have the wooden ones that used to break when people sat on them. More than once they went cracking. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, I think. That's all I need to update you on. I'm sure I missed something, but those are the two public records. And yeah, I told Lauren that we would take her. She might not get here, but she was just coming to tell you the amendment. They weren't worried about it. So I think it just cleared it. School budgets were the ones that would be delayed. <clears throat> Maybe some apple water delay. So, all right. We've got about three minutes. So I'm going to wait. Maybe we, they could take it things out of here this week. I mean, in the good old days, they were packed too deep behind a windowsill. And we always had chairs along there and along there and along here. If we've got two or three minutes before we, we continue, I want to throw something out okay. to the committee as a whole. Uh, you know, we look at this whole mess in education funding, and that's not the only place that, that, that there are issues, the whole revenue stream. Uh, I mentioned this to, to the chair uh, and someone from 
even yesterday or this morning, you know, when it all runs together. I mean, I mean, you've talked about it several times. Recently. That we had, uh, you, those who've been here for a while, remember the Blue Ribbon Tax Commission that we had in oh, 2010, 2011. We're looking for more chairs. And the issues uh, that that commission dealt with that was to recognize that we would make a change in the tax. And it always had a follow on effect because it affected the other major categories of taxes. And so, it, if you make a change in property tax, such as for education, it always seems to have a follow on effect in some other tax that gets affected because it, you know, deductions of, of a variety of things have happened. So what, what the Blue Ribbon Tax Commission was designed to do was take a look at income taxes, consumption taxes, and property taxes, three major categories of taxes. But to do the review of them at one time and in a holistic way, instead of what we have this tendency of doing, as we're doing right now with education, is we're fixing education, but recognizing, we ought to be recognizing that it's going to have some kind of effect on other kinds of taxes uh, as well. Yeah. And the whole idea of the Rubin Tax Commission, uh, and it was consistent, it consisted of three people. It was, uh, I think it was Bill Sayer, Bill Schubert, Schubert? And Kathy Hort. Kathy Hort, right. Uh, so you have people from different political perspectives. Very different perspectives. Very different. And they did, and it's a report yes. we ought to dig out, because I thought they did an excellent job. The problem is they dealt with only two of the taxes. They only had time and dealt with the income tax and the consumption taxes. And the problem with that, and, and it was pointed out at the time, is you could, if you don't do all three at once and you leave the other for a year or two, and in this case, we left it for, what, five or six years yeah. before we went back to it again, the first two taxes that you've dealt with have all changed. And so it, you never catch up unless you do this all at one time. And and, and, a, and their charge was to uh, look at our competitiveness because our highest marginal tax yeah. rate blew us out of the field. Mm -hmm. And so we lowered that. And it took us until the Tax Cut and Jobs Act yeah. uh, to do that because by lowering taxes, Vermont made $30 million. Mm -hmm. Plus, well, you know, the whole idea of doing this all at once, though, is that that way, you, if you talk about doing tax fairness and, and equity and all the things that we talk about, about effective tax systems, unless you take it as a whole, it, it will it will continue to be a mishmash uh, and growing as, as we make a little twist in order to fix some problem, we create yet another problem and we wind up with a monstrosity, which is what we have right now in education funding. I Okay. And so we did my do question one on is, the income tax, and this... I remember saying to you, Randy, be careful what you ask for, oh, because yeah. they didn't go back with it. Oh. They came back with an education income tax. Yes, yeah, they did. Well, my point is that, that this may be the year to, again, propose the, 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 the Blue Ribbon Tax Commission Volume 2 again, and this time do it right. It won't get done this year, no. um, but you know, what we're doing now, I'm, I'm not at all happy with, with the I end don't, result. Of, I don't think it'll happen this year just because they're on an austerity budget across the hall. Mm -hmm. And these cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay. You always pay the coordinator to bring it all together and do the research. And they name oh, the cushion ones. You but send it back, send the it longer back. we fail to deal with this, the, the greater this problem is going to become. Yeah. It is not going to solve itself. No, I think the school tax issue is going to have that. We seem to have an unsustainable system. So we're going to start today once we get chairs in the room. Um, sure. Then we can put some back. Next to the team on that wall. We will have chairs. That nice push here. Okay. okay. We are back. Um, and we are still live. And this is Senate Finance. And today we're going to have some school budget discussions. Um, and we've invited uh, school superintendents, we're still open to having other superintendents to trying to get some that are 
looking at some nearly upward extreme pressures and what some that seem to have been able to control those pressures or at least not looking at as large an increase as some others. So just trying to figure out what levers are pushing what out there. Um, and so first we have Ruby Bonesteel. And Jim Murphy. And Jim Murphy. Me. Okay. Jim, you have to, we only have one witness chair, so. Yeah, I'll, we'll, pull up, pull I'll let him sit in this nice padded chair. Here. I'll take the chair and move forward. You know, I was needed with my daughter. I trust you. The only day I can Julia, Julia did the uh, Oh, yes. Uh, and Julia is going to be here. Um, just, oh, okay. she must have tied up somewhere else, but she will be here. And so, welcome. Thank you. Just introduce yourself and who you represent. Thanks for having us here today. Uh, my name is Libby Monsteel. I'm the superintendent for Montpelier Rockbury School District. And this is coming me as Jim Murphy, the MRPS school board chair for the last six years. Like well versed in our budget as well. Uh, we've been asked here today to share with this committee the reason behind the potential steep increase in the MRPS taxes. And the answer is really quite simple salary and benefits. And that's about it. When these two things are combined with the fact that MRPS now has a smaller share of the state's weighted pupils under F-127, our tax rate after CLA is potentially increasing by 24% in Montpelier and 12.87% Roxbury. I will consistently use the word potentially because we're really not sure what the dollar yield is going to do in the next few months. So, yeah. In response to both the tremendous jobs our teachers and instructional assistants did through the turbulent COVID years and the fact that MRPS must keep up with our surrounding district salary schedules if we're to retain and attract top talent in the classroom, our school board negotiated significant increases for both our teachers and our instructional assistants last year. This has paid off in terms of our ability to keep our staff and attract new people. The salary increase, however, represents $1.5 million in new money for this year's FBF by 25 budget. The legislature negotiates a statewide health care package for educators. The district has no control over this significant influence on our budget. It's now well known that the health care benefit saw over a 16% increase for FY25. This equates to $1.2 million in new money to our budget. The school board did shift. 3.5 FTE, so staff, um, into the FY25 budget that were formerly paid out of a variety of grants, not just ESSER grants, but a variety of them that are no longer available to us. But we also reduced our force by three FTE with a recent potential to increase that number to reduce two more. So a total of five FTE um, because of some recent resignations. And in doing so, the school board is presenting a budget that maintains our current service level. It doesn't <coughs> increase service, nor does it decrease service to our students and families. The MRPS school board is also committed to studying the future of the Roxbury Village School and deciding on its fate prior to the budget decisions for FY26, should our bus budget pass this year. It's really quite simple as to why our budget is increasing the way it is, um, and, but I'm happy to take any questions from the committee, as I know Jim is as well. Okay, committee, any questions? I do have one, if I may. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you read Campaign for Vermont. So they recently sent out a letter, and they talked about a variety of things with the cost drivers in our school. And one argument they made, and I'd love to hear reactions from superintendents, is that Vermont has the most number of adults in the classroom uh, relative to other states. And they included both into this USA facts, which really does show Vermont is an outlier in our staff to student ratio. My, my question to you is, what is your reaction to that? And do you, do you see state policies that we've implemented that are driving the need for additional aids and that you might encourage us to look at in order to start addressing the, the year over year cost to, to educate our kids with all of those full-time employees in our school districts? We do have too many adults in our, in our schools. We have very small classrooms. Slack 5 is in a variety of places. I'm not just talking for Montpelier Roxbury. I think I can say that pretty honestly statewide, that we have some small class sizes. So statewide class size policy may be something that, that, that you know we might want to consider as a state, um, because each individual district has their own right now. I also know that if we go back in time, to when Vermont really um, latched onto and stated that it was a value for Vermont schools to be an inclusive place. 
we include all kids with special needs in our classrooms, which is a value that we hold. And quite honestly, it is one of the reasons why I moved to Vermont as an educator because I share that value. And with it, um, schools are responsible for everything around students with special needs. And we have some significant special needs. Um, and so I believe that's one of the factors, one of the most significant factors for the reason we have so many adults in our in our schools because we have a lot of instructional assistants or one to one assistants um, attached to students. Whereas when I worked in New York, those students were not in my public school classroom. Um, they were in a OC situation. They were, they were in some sort of other alternative educational um, place. Yeah, so it was a different school and not Yeah, it was it was a different um, it was a different way to structure education. And and I, it was the same in the, when I taught in Louisiana as well. So I think that's one of the major driving costs along with very small class sizes in the areas. Well, so I'm definitely uh, fully support mainstreaming uh, to have all kids in the classroom learning together. Absolutely. Um, my next question is, do you feel like any of our, and I don't know the answer to this, so this yeah. is one of those things where I'm like asking you a question or the answer to, do you think there's any state regulations that just make it too easy or encouraging to get IEPs when they might not be necessary, individual education plans, which then you often do translate to increased staffing needs that have, are separate and, and distinct from special needs? know if it would be too easy i it is different from state to state so a child could qualify for a, a learning disability specific learning disability in vermont and not qualify in new york a child could qualify in syracuse new york for a specific learning disability and not qualify with the same scores in brooklyn new york in a in a very intense uh, high poverty school right that's just it's a subjective measure um, and it is just because it's humans making the decisions around these pieces and there are no definitive ways to identify students, particularly with that disability. Um, so there's that piece. And then whether or not to bring a, an instructional assistant into the situation is not a statewide decision. That's an IEP decision, right? So the IEP team is making that determination. I do believe there was a time when if a student was struggling with math or reading that we we attach too many paraeducators at that point in time. I think that is decreasing. Um, it's decreasing in my district. I cannot, I'm not going to state statewide. That is decreasing in my district because of pieces like we've, we've instituted little P policies, not big P policies, but, you know, kind of procedures within our district as to what kind of child would qualify, what kind of special need would qualify for a one-to-one -one aid in our district. It's extreme or volatile behaviors where an unsafe environment could be happening, um, or it's a very intensive life skill need, like toileting or something along those lines, um, very low cognition scores. So no longer would a child with a specific learning disability qualify for, for paraeducator support in our district. I think many districts are moving in that way, but that would just be my assumption, not my knowledge of any kind of objective fact. Well, for your closing comment, just that maybe this is more for our Senate Education Committee, but if we want, we look, when I, my impression of school budgets is 80% of it is, is payroll and yes. salary, mm -hmm. and it's hard to cut. The other 20% is already squeezed in, in efficient, as much efficiency. So if we really want to talk about spending and uh, looking in, at our property tax rates, I think it might be a behoove the Senate Education Committee to get greater, greater clarity, I don't think it's germane to us, as to what uh, is eligible to qualify for an IEP and are there school districts that are using IEPs maybe in ways that are translating to higher cost burdens for the school districts. I don't know the answer to that. I'm just wondering if that's part of this equation that should be explored further. It could be. It could It could definitely be. I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. And at the same time, saying that there's better laws and statutes that, well, that I would, I would yeah. venture to guess most IEP teams are moving their policies. Yeah. Right, what's the classroom size in Roxbury School, generally speaking? So we have a multi, we have multi age classroom. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you jump right to it. Yeah. So we have um, approximately 38 students at Roxbury Village School, 40 maybe now. We have a straight K, so that means only kindergartners in that class. And we have eight kindergartners, I believe, in that in that classroom. Um, and then we have a multi-age one, two, and a multi-age three, four. And those classrooms are between, I believe, they're 16 to 20. And I think that's a traditional way that small schools would yeah. tr work to try to and keep the kids in the classroom if they didn't just keep. It is an, it's yeah. a way, yeah, to do the multi-age. 
we have a challenge though. We have a very small kindergarten class coming in next year. And so how do you make that work? There is also no low killers. Right now we have three registered students and four registered students. Well, <laughs> yeah, and the board did make a decision to take a look at that school and the possibility of moving those students to you know your school. And I know we I know that closing that school would have huge impacts to the town, but yeah, we are looking at those numbers and you know the costs involved. Yeah, uh, well, and there's some major sustainable. Yeah, well, I think that's our concern. Another twenty percent increase across the state in property taxes. That's going to be unsustainable, and it's going to force some people out of their homes. We'll see an increase in taxes. And do the boards worry about that at all? I mean. Yeah, I mean, we are we're very worried about what the, the tax implications of this year's budget have been. Um, yeah, I think if we had, if, if the the seriousness of the numbers, I think we knew with the waiting shift that there would be a, a, an increase from what we had seen previously. I think we had known the size of the increase. We might have pushed questions like the closer of, of Roxbury Village School, um, maybe some additional reductions in force earlier in the process. And we did, we really got this information around September, October. Uh, and I think the consensus of the board was, well, with the, we were kind of we're operating on two assumptions. One, with the cap, you know, we, we, we did put some cost containments in place, but the feeling was unless we really chopped the budget with the cap, we would not see reductions in taxes until we cut something like 3.4 million, which is the number off the table. So we felt we had time to look at, you know, the questions like Roxbury Village School, because the town of Roxbury really wants, yeah, they don't want their uh, the closure process in you know six to eight weeks. Um, then you know with the prospect of cap being removed, uh, you know that that closure kind of would have immediate tax implications. But I think at, at that point, this was just a few weeks ago, and with the where our contract is structured in terms of rifts. At that point, we didn't really have time to have that conversation seriously either. So we are gonna have it next year because we are concerned about, you know, making sure that, you know, our enrollment numbers are not gonna go up and families are not gonna move here or families are gonna move away. Um, so we're very concerned about those tax yeah. numbers um, for a variety of reasons. Didn't you ever wonder how we could cap your taxes at five percent and your spending could go up what twenty percent? I mean uh, that number was set when school spending was doing the norm, which was three to four percent, and suddenly it's hit fifteen on average. Uh, if we capped it, the Montpelier businesses who are still shoveling out mud are gonna pay the difference and we don't have that many second homes in town, so it would be the downtown merchants. And I, I just know how school boards thought we could cap it at five and we could spend it twenty. I think that um, I would, I would say that our school board did not yeah. put unreasonable spending on there. So I just want to make that very clear. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very proud of our school board and our the conversations that they've had. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there was not necessarily a strong knowledge base of how, um, I think everybody on the, on the academic level understands that this is one education fund for the state and that our, our decisions impact each other. This is where, with the 5% cap and what happened with school district decisions, which I do not point any fingers at or blame anybody for, I think that became more abundantly clear to people as to how we impact each other throughout the state um, in a way that had never happened before. And, and so I think there is an added clarity now to that process. Well, this year is unique. I can remember when a 7%, I think it was 7% increase with this governor's first session. We read up the budget and kept up here until June 28, and we ended up drawing back we wanted a 4%. I think we made a compromise on a 5% increase and we brought back in the schools. We just didn't send you that extra money. 
And so this year, to see a 15% is just, yeah. I think, blowing everybody out of the water. And I think mm -hmm. we can agree that we have mutual problems. Oh, yeah. We're trying to figure out what we can do. Um, to be clear, though, to, to get the our tax rate increase below 10%, and I'm talking just squeaking below 10% of yes. where the dollar yield is right now, we'd have to cut $3 million from our current budget. Right. But that's not small. That, that is a lot of money. And I think we're trying to figure out what happened. I mean, we know Esther's money went away. There's some hard feeling because the state put all its federal money into one-time projects and Esther is gone, but many schools seem to be keeping that in their base and then looking at their increase. But we are, in fact, picking up the Esther money from last year. And so, uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out what we can yeah. do. And we level funded. Our salary increases are not because of ESSER positions coming in. Our salary increases is because we negotiated a higher salary, a much higher salary increase. That's what we did. Negotiation now with these and yeah. these. And yeah. yes, we have seen inflation and yeah. we've got comfortable chance. Yeah, no, we, we, yeah, you know, we did move some master positions in, but we eliminated other positions to okay. make room for it. So it was well funded. And I think all the all but about twenty percent or so of our increase was just due to increase in in five percent in salaries. No, I've got healthcare went up. Okay, so salary increase went up. Yeah. One point five. One point two for how all right. And we're and your twenty four percent already counts in the ten cent discount. So we would have been going up thirty four without yeah. that intervention. The other unique thing that happened in Montpelier this year um, is that uh, we were at a very low CLA last year. We were in the seventy percentile last year for CLA. Yeah. Montpelier's reappraisal went through and was on the FY twenty four tax bill for Montpelier. So it it well the budget we passed was with a seventy four percent CLA or something like that. However, what was on the Montpelier residents tax bill was one hundred thirteen percent CLA, which is significantly different. And now, so we were expecting to go from FY twenty four CLA to seventy seventy four percent to a much higher CLA and FY twenty five and working to our advantage in terms of the tax rate increase on paper. Um, that didn't work out. So now we went from 113% CLA to 100% CLA. And normally I'd be dancing a jig in front of you all with 100% CLA, but because of the 13% drop, that significantly influences the tax rate increase as well. Of course, we okay. So you could have passed this budget, but with a different CLA, the tax bills would be different. Yeah. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. And I know how hard you're working. I'm just living in fear. My past. I know. Sorry, just with one. Yes. You talk about one one of the expenses you have to deal with is a special special needs. Okay. Do, does anyone revisit the judgment that a kid? has a disability and requiring special community. Yeah, so every year it's a requirement to have an IPT team meeting at least yearly. That generally happens more. Um, and it's re a child is reevaluated every three years. So they go through the whole process again every three years uh, to, to determine if the, the special need designation is still there. Does anyone check to the question that perhaps the designation of the kid having a learning disability is a self fulfilling. They have to qualify. And so it's not, there, there are certain guidelines that people, that you have to follow. Um, now those guidelines just got a lot easier uh, under new law for specific learning disability. Um, so, easier to follow or easier? Oh no, <laughs> easier to qualify. Oh. <laughs> Um, so that just recently changed under 173 with new new laws. 
So um, with specific disabled disability specifically, um, but it is revisited every three years with the IEP team. And of course the IEP team consists of school officials and parents, and sometimes the child and um, outside uh, evaluators at times, school psychologists. So there's a large team around making that determination and, and a child has to qualify through certain gates and there's multiple multiple gates the child has to qualify under. So it, it can't it can't be the way of somebody else. <laughs> no, what I'm getting at is this is a constituent who had said that she felt her, her son was not being adequate to this knowledge. Because mm -hmm. he gave very easy, uninteresting work. Approach at a specific learning disability or something? No. Or just that the work was unchallenging mm -hmm. and uninteresting. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the school gave her was because mm -hmm. SLD. They said, well, you know, it has a specific learning disability, and so we don't want to cause frustration and experience of failure. That would be an interesting statement to make to parents, and I would hope that parent would go talk to the director of student services or the superintendent <laughs> in response to that. Right. I'm going to move us. Why don't you talk to us or state senator? Or, you know, you can have it. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I next have Mark Sucker from the Caledonia Central Supervisory Union. And Senator McDonald, will you take over for a minute? I have a note from a constituent who wants to meet me in the hall. Yes. So I have to go tell him I can't meet him. So, Mr. Okay, Mark Tucker is up there. Hi, I want to do a sound check first because I have trouble. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear you? Well, Identify yourself for the record, please. Yeah, I will. Um, so, hi, I'm Mark Tucker. I'm superintendent for Caledonia Central Supervisory Union, serving seven schools in Caledonia County and northeastern Washington County. And I was asked to speak with you today about budget increased cost drivers. I'm happy to share the experience of the five districts and seven schools that I serve. Um, this is my seventh and last year as a superintendent responsible for creating, explaining, and supporting school budgets in CCSU. What I've learned over the years is that school budget development is always an exercise in sausage making. This year, FY25, making that sausage and keeping it edible in our communities has been especially challenging because we have to add a number of unpalatable ingredients to the basic recipe. One such ingredient is the Act 127 pupil waiting formula rollout, which on its face benefits the rural districts that I serve, has caused no end of confusion as the legislature is in the midst of correcting a well-intended but poorly worded adjustment aimed at softening the blow felt by formerly advantaged districts that lost pupil count. Another is that AOE was tardy with the release of the new pupil counts and really didn't, and we really didn't know until January what our pupil counts would be. A third new ingredient is that while the tax department met its statutory obligation to provide FY25 CLA numbers on January 1st, we have for years been spoiled because we were able to release these numbers in early December. So we chewed our nails off for three weeks waiting for this important data point, expecting these numbers to drop only to be shocked by how much they did, as my colleague Libby Bonesteel just mentioned to you. Uh, lastly, after a couple of years of tax rate buy-downs via high yield rates, a precipitous drop in that important rate happened. It was adjusted in part due to changes to the people waiting method and in part due to declining revenue from non-property tax sources. And this added to the upward pressure on homestead tax rates. Any one of uh, these would have been problematic. All of them occurring at the same time has made for a stressful budget cycle, to put it mildly. Um, all of this uncertainty unfolded during the heart of our budget process. The initial yield rate from the December 1st letter was adjusted downward shortly after the legislature came back into session, but is now projected to go up again as a result from the proposed correction to Act 127. In so-called normal years, we anticipate stability in the yield rate from December 1st until the day before you all adjourn. When you typically find a bit more money for the education fund, raise the yield rate, and then the education tax rate drops between the time the budgets are passed and the tax bills go up. It is difficult in any year to explain to our taxpayers how we arrive at projected tax rates, but this is not a normal year. 
And while we've set our education spending for FY25 in all five CCSU districts, our presentation of the tax impact and informational meetings before election dates will be in flux right up until the day of the meetings. Um, I want to pause for a moment to say something about CLA rates. Uh, we hear from our taxpayers and you hear from your constituents that the, the dramatic increases in homestead tax rates are unacceptable. Yeah. Act 127 introduced a new term to our tax rate discussion through the soon to be eliminated 5% tax cap, the pre-CLA tax rate. Technically, there's always been a pre-CLA rate, I suppose, but it just didn't factor into our discussions. Now I think it serves as a useful illustration of how the dramatically decreasing CLA rates across the state are impacting the homestead tax rate calculation. The effect of decreasing CLA rates impacts every school district in CCSU by raising respective homestead tax rates. The application of the CLA percentage by itself adds anywhere from 19 cents to a high of 64 cents <clears throat> homestead tax rate in the eight communities that comprise CCSU. And this can be seen in detail in the table that's at the bottom of my written testimony. School districts are not responsible for and cannot directly influence the CLA rate in the communities. In CCSU, we have communities that completed a reappraisal in the past year or two, only to see their CLA rate drop by as much as 10 to 20 points. You heard this very same thing from Libby Bonesteel a few minutes ago. This is happening because of explosive increases in the selling price of properties and the current methods for completing reappraisals cannot keep up with the demand. You've heard and will continue to hear calls for elimination of the CLA as a factor in tax calculations. It's above my pay grade to imagine another way to equalize the homestead tax rates across Vermont communities. But if CLA is the best way to do it, then I would like to see something done to speed up the reappraisal process so that we are not experiencing CLA rates in the 70s and 80s, resulting from 10 point drops year to year as the community waits in a queue for a reappraisal. And finally, to the extent that you might hear complaints about homestead tax rate inflation from those who are negatively affected by the loss of pupil counts resulting from the Act 127 pupil weighting adjustments, I respectfully suggest it is worth looking at how much of the tax rate increase results from a loss of long-term average daily membership, which is a new term for the pupil count, and how much results from unusually low CLA rates. The first, readjusted pupil weights, is a good thing for those of us who have been penalized by the old methods in place since 1997, and that is all of my districts here in CCSU. The second, low CLA rates driven by exploding uh, property values is a boat that we all float in that should not be used to denigrate the larger equity goals that drove Act 127 in the first place. But all of this so far has to do with homestead and income sensitive tax rates, admittedly the numbers that most residents really care about. But you asked about our spending and the 800 pound gorilla in the room is something that my fiscally responsible school boards have no control over, namely inflation. Inflation has affected each district in similar ways to greater or lesser degrees, and I've named the specific impacts in the second table at the end of my written testimony. But I want to make two important points in summary here in my oral testimony. First, all of the districts are seeing cost increases related to some combination of special education cost increases resulting in large part from increases in the unfunded mental health obligation that continues to drain the education fund. Staff salary increases negotiated during the COVID-19 pandemic when we were concerned about losing teachers to higher paying districts in the midst of an overall teacher shortage. Spiral and health insurance premiums that are up 16.4% for next year that, de that defy the legislature's belief of the statewide negotiation of school employee health care rates would somehow lower these premiums. The transferring of the last few employees from ESSER grant funding to local funding, a process that we actually started in FY24. Deficits arising from unplanned mid-year maintenance. And finally, the need to fund after-school programs and local budgets as the ESSER grant money expires next September. This last after-school funding is problematic because it appears that money that was added to the education fund last session for school operated after school programs has been siphoned away for use in part by private after school providers, none of which operated my supervisory unit. 
Second point is that the money that my district boards added to their FY25 spending is, for all intents and purposes, due to these inflationary pressures that I just named, accounting for 94% to more than 100% of the increases in total expenditures. And you might say, how could it be more than 100%? In a couple of cases uh, where the inflationary increases exceeded 100%, we accounted for that by reducing other line items in the budget. Importantly, we did not add money to district budgets to take advantage of the so-called 5% pre-CLA loophole that was part of Act 127, the famous or infamous Section 7 language, in which the House is working on eliminating. The likely loss of the elimination of the 5% pre-CLA cap does, does affect four of my five districts, but that's a tax rate issue, not a spending issue. Excuse me. Finally, with three of my districts, Cabot, Danville, and Twinfield, facing a PCB remediation obligation, and the Agency of Natural Resources proposing not to fund this remediation in defiance of state law, these three district boards are facing the potential of having to put these remediation costs themselves. This is a topic that may be beyond the scope of today's hearing, but in simple terms, the ANR proposal says, one, there's not enough money to fund remediation needs for schools already needing that money, Two, there's no funding stream identified for adding money to the PCB remediation fund in FY25. Three, ANR is prioritizing testing of new sites with the potential that additional testing will add to the number of schools for which there is no remediation money. And finally, ANR's proposal not to fund remediation does not come up with a relief from the regulatory requirement that we do the remediation. Down the road, unfunded PCB remediation is likely to be the new 800-pound gorilla that will challenge my successor starting on July 1st. I'm happy to take any questions the committee might have. Okay. Um, Mark, what, what is tax rate you're looking at in your schools? Um, Increase. So it, it goes anywhere from... Um, I didn't put these in order. Anywhere from a dollar fifty-seven in Marshfield up to uh, two hundred seven in Cabot. Okay, uh, yeah, Cabot. In, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, what what is that in percentage increase? Um, I didn't calculate the percentage increase. I can tell you that the. You know, the, I, I can tell you, I, I calculated it in pennies. I didn't give you the percentage increase. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I don't oh. have that right in hand. But they, you know, uh, Marshfield is going from 137 to 157. <clears throat> Cabot's going from 143 to 207. Uh, Peacham's going from 162 to 195. So, That's you know, where we have seen tax rates, homestead tax rates, typically in the 160s, out in my districts, which is significantly higher than some of uh, uh, some of my neighbors, uh, we're seeing them starting to push up towards a two dollar rate. And it's but the point being that it's largely a function. I mean, you could say that it's because we're spending too much money, but with the money that we're additional spending that we added to our budgets this year is largely spending that we didn't have any control over. Um, and the reason the homestead tax rate goes up so much is because we're continuing to see 10 to 15 to 18 uh, percent or point drops in the CLA from year to year. Okay. Questions? Committee? Any the tax department tells us that the CLA just keeps everyone honest so that everybody stays, is being taxed at their full 100%, 100 of your grand right. And But that does impact the rate as it's shown on sure. my tax bill. Yeah, and I, I want to be clear, I'm not, I'm not one of those people that thinks you throw out the CLA. I understand the purpose of it. And I understand how, basically how it works. I don't ask me to calculate them, but I know how I know the intent of the numbers. Um, and what I've said to people uh, repeatedly is that uh, just because your homestead tax rate is going up, 
you have to keep in mind that that rate is being applied to a piece of property that's undervalued in the current marketplace. And so one of the things that the way that, C, as I have always understood CLA is, is it's a leveling thing. And so when we go to the community, uh, when a community goes through a reappraisal and they get their CLA back up to closer to 100%, their tax rate, their homestead tax rate is going to go on, but that tax, tax rate is applied to properties at a higher value. So that's a, you know, it's not right. functionally, it does what it's supposed to do. The issue is perceptually, residents view that as, oh my God, you're raising my taxes by 20 cents. How can you do that? You're overspending. And so it's it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult issue to explain. Uh, we get better and better at it every year, I'd like to think. And we talk about that. The other thing is that um, um, that's helped some over the last few years is that I think we've gotten pretty adept at explaining to our taxpayers that, you know, and this is just rock average, but most of my districts, there's only maybe at most 25 or 30 percent of the taxpayers that are not, that don't benefit from some form of income sensitivity. Uh, and so uh, there are, there's a very small percentage of residents that actually pay the full homestead tax rate uh, because the value of their property and their income is at a level where they qualify for income sensitivity. I live in Danville. I happen not to be income sensitive. Um, and so I pay the full, uh, the full homestead tax rate on the property that my wife and I own. But I'm in a very small percentage in a Danville community. I think we're around 20, 21 or 22 percent of, of the population in Danville that pay strictly on the value of their home. I think so I'm not disputing CLA. I'm just saying that it does have a, uh, as the CLA rate drops, it has the, it has a phenomenon of looking like your, your spending is driving up tax rates. And it takes some, it takes some effort on our part to explain to people who want to take the time to listen that A, you may not be affected by this anyway because you're income sensitive. And B, you know, as I just said, it's a it's it's intended to level the rates. So um, I'm not opposed to CLA, but I, I do see some people complaining about their tax rates jumping significantly. And I think it's important to keep in mind that some in some cases, just to some extent, anybody's increase lately in their homestead tax rate is a function of the real estate market and not necessarily spending. And it's certainly, certainly not the fall of Act 127. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Question, Sandra. Um, a question. I'm just checking in. I'm guessing that that is Mark Tucker from National Life Insurance Company. Yes, and Chris. I was looking at your bow tie, and I said, I think yeah, I've seen that. Part before. I haven't seen you for like thirty years. It's good to see you, Chris. Yes, good to see you too. You haven't aged the day. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, well, nor have you. <laughs> we've done we've done pretty well in this block climate. Mutual liars club. All right, thank you. Yeah. Good to see yeah. you. Good to see okay. you. Okay, committee. Any questions? Uh, I'm sure. Yes. I I thought that on the tax bills, the uh, effective tax rate is also published. Is that correct or not? Oh no. On on the tax bills from the town. When you receive your tax bill yeah. and it's about education taxes, it has your tax rate for yes, the town. Yes. But it all, does it not also include the effective tax rate, which is a comparable tax rate taking into account CLA and left and right, and you can compare with neighboring towns? Mm, I, I don't feel like I can answer that question adequately. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mark. Okay. Okay. Next. Next. Ryan Parody. Um, Hi. South. Is there a way to plug in? Pardon? There is there a way to plug in? You can join the Zoom. Alternatively, you sent me the presentation so I can put yeah. it up there. Okay. I just sent you a link too. That might be. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> so, correct. Yes.
Right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Herdy. I'm the superintendent for the Moyle South Supervisory Union. We represent Elmore, Morristown, and Stowe. I'm also the proud principal of the last one room schoolhouse in the state of Vermont, in Elmore. If you've never been there, I encourage you to come out and visit and, uh, and spend some time there. I just want to first say that I really appreciate your time and I appreciate this opportunity. I think it speaks volumes about the state of Vermont that we have this opportunity to come here and discuss something that will impact so many and be here and engage in discussion on uh, such a critical topic. So I do uh, truly appreciate this time. So when we start thinking about uh, what's the best way to the you next or all right next whatever you next want to say okay so I've been asked to talk about spending pressures and education um, costs and I think it's important first to talk about when we're assembling our budget and we're thinking about how we're spending money the first thing that we want to think about is what is going to improve student learning outcomes and we know based on research that the number one impact on student learning is teacher quality and we know the number two impact on student learning is principal quality. So when we're thinking about how we're making investments and, and how we're putting together our budget, these are the two things that we think about the most. So this is a quote that I would encourage you to read. It's from uh, a global health researcher who has done a lot of work around the world in third world countries around improving health systems. And essentially the, the summary of this quote is that, you know, just by adding more people, more tools, more resources, you're not guaranteeing that you're going to have improvement in the system. And the only way that we can truly improve the system is by thinking about how we bring people together, how we have strategy, how we have a plan, and how we work toward common goals. So back to our, our teacher quality and, and how we're uh, designing our plan around truly improving student learning. And so we know around the state that we have a rising number of teachers that are on emergency licenses. So we know what that means is that there's a lot of teachers that haven't been through a high quality educator preparation program and that uh, we're putting those teachers in front of our kids consistently. We also know that we have declining enrollment in preparation programs throughout the state and also throughout the country. We know that we have pension challenges, we have housing challenges. Um, we have a low number of applicants for positions when we post them in the state of Vermont. As someone that has been uh, a principal in Massachusetts, when I would post a position, I might have 250, 300 applicants for an elementary teacher position. When we post a position here, we might have two. And that's a real problem. Um, and, and what I would ask you to really consider is that final question, would you convince your own child to become a teacher right now? And if the answer to that is no, then I would, I would ask us all to really think about how are we strategizing, where are we putting our resources, and are we focusing on the right thing? So just looking at investment priorities right now. So Vermont's ranked number two in school spending. We're ranked number 50 in student enrollment per teacher. Senator, I think you had a question about class sizes. So we are the second lowest uh, in the country for class sizes. We're ranked number 19 for teacher salaries. So we're approximately $6,000 below the national average. Okay, but we have the lowest. I think told we have the lowest. USAFacts.org from the campaign of Vermont has us at the lowest but just a different source. Yeah, yeah. And I would, you know, there are some there are some links in the presentation. And so I would encourage you to reach uh to click on those and look at that. Um there was a report put together by the GFO that that discusses all of this and it's a very well done report and it has all this data in it. Um and that that's a good way to look at at the uh, references. And so when we're thinking about other spending pressures and what we're seeing in our schools, i just like to point out a few things. First is a youth mental health crisis. If you've read the Bright Futures report that just came out recently, what is noted in that report is that Vermont is an anomaly as far as overall mental health crisis. So we are seeing a rise in mental health challenges in our youth that other states around the country are not seeing. So I just want to stress that it's unique to the state of Vermont um, and also we have, uh, there was a discussion about special education. So we have limited placement options for students that are struggling within our schools. 
we have a legal responsibility to provide the least restrictive environment. So that means we need to provide the best environment for our students that they, so that they can be successful. For all students that may not be the public school based on the level of need or therapeutic support that they require, in Vermont, if a student is outplaced or needs a more therapeutic environment for their learning, the wait list could be two or three years for that student. So what that means is that we're developing our programs internally. So we are adding more resources to our school. We are putting more pressure on our classrooms. We are essentially navigating the impact of the mental health crisis and a lot of the other uh, concerns that we're seeing within our classrooms. And that is, is not only is it expensive, it's not always in the best interest of kids. And so while I 100% agree with the, with inclusion, with full inclusion, and I you know, have a master's degree in special education, I've been a special educator, those are things that I truly believe in. I also think that every child is an individual and needs something to be successful. And what is the environment that they truly need to thrive? And not every child, uh, not every child can thrive um, in a public school. We also have the challenges of an opioid epidemic, homelessness. Uh, these are things you all know, right? High, these are all things playing out in our school. We have a high cost of living. Um, we have a 16.4% increase in our health care costs. We have challenges with housing. We have a lot of people that want to move to Vermont or move to our communities that can't find homes. Uh, specific challenges that we see in our three towns is with our housing. A lot of the housing that when I when I moved to Vermont, there were still homes that, that would be considered affordable right now. Those homes have been snatched up over the past couple of years, oftentimes by people that are using them as short-term rentals. They may be LLCs, but they're using that consistently to generate profit. And that profit oftentimes is leading the state of Vermont. And so it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, we have excessive school spending. We have planning enrollments. Um, our agency of education, so something that I really would like to stress is that for almost a year, we haven't had a secretary, a permanent secretary of education. This is a really challenging time for school districts around the state. And we, I, I feel like we're often being put in this situation where we're just uh, set up to survive on our own and take care of ourselves. And we really um, need strong leadership and a plan for how we're going to navigate this together. So we're all working towards positive solution. Our, the government yeah. makes that decision. Yeah. And, and I share your concern. Um, and as far as data system in the state of Vermont, you know, we don't have a longitudinal data system that allows us to really see how our students are performing clearly. We have uh, uh, Act 127, which is predicated on literacy and math scores. That really is what is the legislation is predicated on, providing enough resources so that students can perform at a certain level. Right now, we do not have any sort of clear accountability measure that shows that students are actually performing, where they're performing, and how we can gauge that across the state. It makes it very hard to say to our taxpayers when they come to us and they say, how are students doing compared to other towns or other areas around the state? It's nearly impossible for us to provide that data for our taxpayers and for our parents. I've heard from here yeah. that being the first or second highest spending per pupil in the country, that our national test scores are not what you think that extra money would buy you. And just trying to understand what's going on here. And I, and I would say, you know, academic performance is on there, right? It's on this list. I think we're seeing declining academic performance over time. And I, that goes back to that question, where are we putting our investments? Are we putting them in the right place? Are we recruiting and retaining high quality educators in the state or are we not? And if we're not, we are not going to see increased academic performance across the board. I just want to pick on one thing I think I heard you say on this slide, just to make sure yeah. I heard it correctly. It has to do with, and maybe I'm getting the terms wrong, mainstreaming and inclusive classrooms. And I think I heard you say, which is uh, slightly different than what I think I heard Superintendent Bonesteel say, that you see, think there might be opportunities for both benefiting the child and the children more, while also maybe achieving a lower staff to student ratio or a higher staff to student ratio, thus creating some efficiencies. Yeah. Uh, do you see state policies currently in place that are, are forcing um, the inclusive classrooms, and if mainstreaming isn't the correct word, I apologize, but do you see policies in Vermont um, mandating more one-on-one -on -one paraeducators that we might want to revisit or focus on? 
Yeah, I mean, I would point you to the DMG report that was done in 2018. And so the DMG report uh, was part of the creation of Act 173. And really, it, it showed clear evidence that we have a, a significant over-reliance on paraprofessionals in the state. There's a lot of data, a lot of information there. But essentially, there is a culture in Vermont of over-reliance on paraprofessionals to provide direct instruction. And really... We have, you know, it's it's a culture of yeah. what is the solution? More people. And we need to be thinking about that. We've been trying to break that for uh, at least in 2018. I will read that report. My, my next question is, is the state mandating it? Or are you saying that schools are self-selecting to over-rely on paraeducators? I think it comes down to funding. Right. I mean, if you're putting in your budget that you have funds to be able to hire more people, that's oftentimes an easy solution to say, well, how are we going to navigate this? We're going to navigate it with additional people. And if we have a lot of emergency licensed educators that are in our classrooms and we have students with really high needs, we're in a situation where it's really hard to teach students when you're navigating all these you're different people. You're a teacher in the same way. Yep. And oftentimes, I will say, our, our teachers, you know, they don't come to us at, uh, likely with a request for an additional student or additional paraprofessional, you know, and we have systems in place where we really think about what is, you know, what are the, the gateways to make sure that it's appropriate to add an extra individual into the classroom. And with the level of need that we're seeing right now, it's, it's oftentimes, yes, we need another adult in the classroom, and, and oftentimes it's tied to safety. And it's student safety and it's and it's uh, teacher safety. So, you know, it goes back to those questions around, you know, is this the right environment for some students that really need more therapeutic intensive supports? And we do not have options in Vermont that are, you know, at least where we're located. If we want to uh, provide that option for a family, we are hearing from schools, we're sorry, we're full, or the wait list is long as, as two or three years. And the parents agree that the student would benefit from an alternative environment. We agree, um, but the options just aren't there. So, so we're building that capacity within our schools, but that takes years. <clears throat> it's very costly, and it's very challenging to do within a public school while you're trying to do so many other things. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't need to go through all of these. I mean, you, you kind of get the point. We're, we're navigating a lot right now in our state. Um, and when we're thinking about how we're putting together our our budgets with what we can control and what we can't control. And I can and I can give a, a little bit of credit to, to Libby over there for this slide, because this is something that we've talked about. Um, but there are things that we can control. So we can control the employees that we hire, our supervision and evaluation, our negotiated agreements, uh, the material, the curriculum we purchase, our PD offerings, those are things we can control. And then you can see the list of all the things that we can't control. So we can't control our CLAs or yield, the, the healthcare increases, the legislative mandates that come our way. These, you know, PCB contamination we can't control. Capital improvement uh, we can't control. Uh, there's a lot. Inflation, special education. These are all cost drivers we're experiencing right now. So I, this brings us to Act 127, which is um, probably the one of the hottest topics uh, of discussion right now. So some some. Uh, bullets that I would like to, you to think about with Act 127. I, I believe that it assumes some districts have been operating with excessive spending. And when you look at the list of challenges that we're navigating, you think about everything that we're trying to uh, overcome to make sure our students are provided with high quality education. There are not very many districts that have extra money that they can cut from their budgets without it significantly impacting children. I believe it also assumes a direct correlation between spending and student outcomes. So are we saying, as in that quote right there, by adding more resources, we are going to increase the, the student learning outcomes just by contributing more money to more people? Or do we have a strategic way to really think about how this money is being allocated? The other challenge with Act 127 is that it provides the full benefit in year one for new pupil rates. And so districts that are advantaged by Act 127 are getting full access to all of those funds in year one. And that means that there's a high cost to that. And where is that money coming from? So if districts don't have room to cut and we're increasing the spending in all these other districts, you can see where the gap is. And I believe this was discussed in depth uh, when Act 127 was put to vote. And it was discussed that uh, there should be considered an income-based tax formula to fund some of that gap. 
that you know hasn't come to fruition. And so we're in the situation so, so now. Is spent yeah. months on a committee looking at doing an income base and there was no way where we could just hit the higher income because of the system, the equalizing system that we need to have. Um, I'll tell you, I had people on that committee that thought it was just a piece of cake and it turned out it was not, but we have looked at it and I'm sure we will look at it again. And and you have uh, much more experience than I do in these matters. I, I've got a little bit of education over the past few weeks as we've become more involved, but um, but I certainly don't have all the solutions or all the information to, to make the policy. And when the bill left the Senate, it phased both in up and down over five years. So the last, yeah, you know, the last. Um, May I ask you to accomplish? Oh, of course. Uh, so the last bullet point you have here, and this is, yeah. again, I don't know the answer to this question. We're really trying to understand this. The incentivizes cost drivers, mm -hmm. small schools, over reliance, and paraprofessionals. I'm looking at the five categories that 127 has for rates certain grades, economically defined backgrounds, English language learners, living in a school district with sparse population, or depending on geographically necessary small school. My question to you is, and this is, I'm really trying to understand this, do you see the IEPs and the paraprofessional determinations as factoring into the pupil weights? Like when a school district determines that an IEP is necessary with some category, does that affect the weights in any way? Not, not to my knowledge. Okay. So then I'm just curious how you see that the weights are incentivizing cost drivers. Well, if you think about additional funding, right? So if you think about additional funding that's not connected directly to accountability. So if a district gets a lot of extra dollars, how are they spending those dollars? Okay. Typically they're spending those dollars on additional people. We know based on the over, you know, based on the budget percentages. And so without accountability measures, make sure that the, those dollars are going to the right place. What we're doing is incentivizing additional people in our schools. And we throw in the challenges around licensing and the mental health the challenges and everything else that we're navigating. People are the- In, in our defense. Yeah. There was a real move. The big winner in this is schools with second languages. The losers seemed to be people who had low income students. I don't know, it was decades ago. This has never been altered. Uh, they don't have those low income students now. And so those, those seem to be the big ones. I trained the Um so maybe this is where you're going with it. Is uh, you call categorize this as incentive incentivizes cost drivers? I, I'm seeing it more, and I think words are important. Is really this is a lack of spending accountability. Right. We don't have visibility into what our schools are spending relative to each other. So we similar to the performance standards you're just speaking to. I don't have a clear understanding of what Manuski is spending versus Roxbury versus Lamoille County and so on. And that's where there's no spending accountability. If we get taxing capacity through waiting. You just get it, and the state right. does it. You can use it to lower your tax rate, or you can use it as we intended to provide extra services. There was a big movement to make English as a second language because it is such a need in a few towns. Um, a grant, um, as another name, but a grant so that there would be accountability. It got really nasty in here. The word racism was thrown around, and yes, we backed off because it was uh, the people involved are really nasty, but I at least haven't been concealed, accused of racism yet in this whole discussion. Everything yeah. else, but not that. Yeah, and I think those are really hard conversations to have, right? And when we're yeah. talking about equity, I, I think that is probably one of the reasons why more people haven't been participating in this discussion, because they're concerned about that topic and that it's very sensitive and they want to make sure that that um, they're coming out clearly and saying that we're for equity. Yeah. You know, I believe, I truly believe that your zip code shouldn't determine the quality of education that you receive. I also believe that sh there should be evidence that what you're doing and where you're putting your investments is working mm -hmm. and there's accountability standards connected to that so that we're, you know, we're making sure we're monitoring over time um, how those work out. That was another the education committee. This actually went through a lot. Let's see if we, maybe now we can try to win that. Sure, to, I'll try to go through these uh, quickly. I, I appreciate your time. I apologize. I stepped yeah. up just to run to the bathroom, but the hall is full of angry people. Oh. Several of them wanted to talk to me. So. 
I just kind of, I wanted to show you some numbers so that you can see how this is playing out in different districts. So for Stowe, with, uh, with the current law, 127, and the yield at 9171, which was the yield we were initially given in the 5% cap. So as we were putting together our budget, we looked at this and we started thinking, okay, well, where are we at? If we put together our budget from FY24, so we put a level budget, which was, which would be significant cuts and we wouldn't be able to safely operate our schools. We would still see a 24% increase in our property tax based on our loss of pupils. If our first warrant budget you'll see up there with the ed spending was at a 24% tax increase. So you can see that there's a $2 million swing between what we can spend to maintain the same tax rate, right? And that's that's the cap. And I can completely understand the challenge with the cap and, and the issue that that has created across the state. When we start to think about explaining to our taxpayers that they're gonna have a 24% property tax increase, and we have roofs that are leaking, we have parking lots that are full, that are full of potholes, and we have you know critical safety repairs that need to be made. Okay. You, you yeah. see the, yes? Bill was the mayor. Yeah. All right, Stowe chose to come out of that. So they are now operating with a school with I estimate 56 kids in a grade. Um, 800 divided by 12. Um, those were choices the people of Stowe made. Yeah. I still don't understand how anyone could think that we could cap your tax, which is revenue, and allow at five and allow your spending to go up to 19. I, where where was the other money coming from? I don't think anyone did. I mean, these are conversations that we've had. Oh, they're sure and, angry about it. And, well, the conversations that have been had for months have been that this was setting up a situation where there was more spending than there was revenue coming in. And when you start thinking about that equation, it just it didn't make sense. And and I never understood how how this legislation was put forward, understanding there was such a large gap in it funding. Was put forward and that we didn't do it. What I have from the house is school spending has traditionally gone up three to four percent a year. Seven percent was a major crisis. Um, it's going up on average of fifteen percent. So when it was four, capping it at five, and it was only supposed to be for the impact of the new waiting system. But there's no unless you want every business in stone to be taxed our business, I mean, because that's who pick it up. Could you clarify if this includes the new cent discount, which for this document in front of me would be 11 cents? Does this dollar 21 have the 11 cent discount? Uh, yeah, so step, so number two, up there, scenario number two, has the cap removal with the 11 cent discount. So what you'll see, our first warrant budget would have resulted in 40% property tax increase. And so based on the messaging we received from the state and based on the, the reality of a 40% tax increase, we went back, we rewarded our budget, we delayed our vote, and we we cut $1.5 million, almost $1.6 million out of our budget. That's that still capital spending, right? The that was that was I, I mean, I think language is important. Those are critical, yeah, those are. are critical repairs. And so that's roofing repair, that's parking lot, that's safety. Yeah issues that, that will need to be addressed that have been identified in the state report as $325 million budget yeah. bill for yeah. finding the money to do those critical repairs yeah. in the state. I don't know where we're going to get $325 million, but we're going to have to. Um, yeah. We have not helped the schools, um, and we're going to have to find it. I just don't know where yet. And I, I think, you know, the scenario that I provided to the board, um, just so they could understand the magnitude and our taxpayers could understand the magnitude of this, is for us to get to a 9% tax increase, we'd have to cut $3 million out of our budget. And for us, that would close our schools. There's That would be an elimination of, of all of the critical repairs and 19 educators. And we have 20 classroom teachers at Stowe Elementary School, just to give you an idea about how that right. play out. 20. Yeah. So I don't question what you just stated. I just want to confirm I'm following what you have here. So if you level funded your budget this yeah. year, that would be the fifteen million thirty nine thousand five hundred. And if you just 
she had the same exact budget as last year, it would be an 8.63% increase. Is that correct? Um, yes. Based on that, based on that information, yes. Yeah. Um, so if the, you could just show the next slide. Something that I wanted to address is tax capacity because I, I've heard, you know, comments made that wealthy towns have more money to give to, you know, throughout the state. And what I want to do is just clarify the tax capacity of our residents in our towns. So if we look at this, what it shows clearly is that 49% of our year-round residents in Stowe are paying more than 30% of their income towards housing. If you gauge that on the state of Vermont, that is a, you know, a, a significant difference. And so our taxpayers are already at their capacity. And so if the assumption is, well, the, the wealthier towns will just pay more, there is no more to give. And I think that that needs to be clear to people because our, our residents, what will happen here is that people will sell their homes. They'll have to sell their homes and the people that move in most likely will use those homes, at least in our towns. They will use those homes as short-term rentals, and it will erode our communities. And we will not have educators. We will not have, uh, you know, our coaches, our select board members, our school board members. These are people that live year-round that make our communities. And we're seeing this play out in real time right now. And, you know, it's it's a reason that I really just want to advocate so passionately that that careful consideration is made around the impact of these changes. Okay, I think a, um, not told, I think half the population of Stowe yeah. is that no, Act 60 in the Brigham decision leveled it. There are no more gold towns, and I don't know anyone here who thinks there is. I think what we're hearing is that there are broad financial and social pressures being put on schools and but we have the highest people spending. We're the only state that does this. We're the only state that has complete local control over school budgets. And it, you know, I think this year's numbers are begging the question is, is this an efficient way? Because when you've got this kind of numbers and small schools, are they able to do the kind of education that's required? to get into tech school anymore. I mean, I think getting computer programming and robotics, uh, you're a bigger, wealthier school. And they, we've got to talk about it because we're not getting any economies of scale here. Yes. Um, if you were talking earlier about what what, what is the uh, characteristics of an excellent education yes, sir. in the classroom. And uh, what is what is the number one correlation that you had? Teacher quality. And then the next three. Principal quality. The next three. <laughs> the next three, well, there's. Not uh, in perfect order, but. Okay, yeah. Here for some support. I mean, yeah, it, it comes down to, you know, how student needs are being met in a variety of ways. And I would say, uh, quality of education, it comes down to the quality of the teacher is the number one, the quality of the principal is number two, uh, the ability of the staff to collaborate, which is called collective efficacy, so the, the staff's belief in whether or not students can be successful, so the cultural elements of school is very high up on that list, um, and those are those are the top ones of the top, top of my head. Thank you. Um, we've talked here on occasion about how you measure how well you're doing um, and we, we keep hearing about standardized tests, and I'm forgetting that the language you use to to um, evaluate students who have left school and graduated a couple of years later. Um, when you will measure their evaluations, you know, five years after they graduated from high school, what do you measure? It's not standardized tests. Well, you know, I, I think there's a long discussion about the use of standardized testing and, and that we haven't been able to show that it actually, by implementing more standardized testing, we've been able to, we have not been able to improve student learning. For the measure after school, um, what measures are being used to determine all oh, 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 of Bloom's tech, <laughs> Bloom's stuff. Bloom's nonsense. Uh, 
Yeah. When kids leave school, some schools do you know, take a look at what they're doing 10 years yeah. after they graduate. Yeah. And sometimes kids are yeah. doing things that were uh, successful that don't correlate with their standardized tests. Yeah. Um, it's hard to measure that. Kind of, it's hard to measure that. We we might well, send out surveys, but, but that. it's dependent on students replying. That's, what, um, that's why they don't measure. Yeah. But that should be the Department of Education. We should be uh, doing surveys and asking them to be the Department of Education. We should be to ask small schools to trace their students for ten years is pretty hard. We know our college preparedness that gets tested, and um, we know we have a lot of students taking remedial. In college, um, a lot of them drop out because they get discouraged taking remedial classes that they should get the ability in high school. And that's a national problem. Uh, Paul Putin, whose name I'm not remembering because it was many years ago when I went, when I was sharing education, I did go to a couple of national conferences. It's, it's a national issue. It's very I, I will say we had we had a measure a few years ago in Vermont that was called um, an integrated field review, and I thought it was a very effective way to, to talk about how schools were doing. And what we did is there were administrators and teachers from different districts that came into your school, and they evaluated the education quality standards on a rubric, and they basically gave you a report afterwards, and they said, how is your school doing? And that, I'm not sure what had happened to that process, but... I did think it was another measure outside of standardized testing that can show how schools were doing. No secretary of education. Uh, amongst other things. Anne, okay. can I can I make a couple uh, of comments? Yes, both back. Thank you. And yes, I'm sorry if I'm sort of jumping in a little out of context. Um one, I, I feel like we're talking about standardized testing as a measure of student success, but I just want to make sure we're reminding ourselves that we have just implemented something that reflected on our standardized test scores and recognized that the populations who were trying to provide more per pupil spending for were doing significantly worse on those tests. So a big part of our effort was to try and give greater resources to the students we knew weren't as successful on those tests before we pat ourselves on the back and say we have a really great education while other states have a lot more diversity and, and probably more English language learners. The, the second thing I wanna say is I'm incredibly sympathetic to Stowe's unique situation around housing. And I do wanna point out that from our data in the housing committee, it is a unique situation. Um, the towns that are high in vacation and ski rentals are just far and away the towns that have a significant proportion of short-term rentals. And it's not something that makes sense for statewide policy at the moment because it's so concentrated in a very small number of towns. And we'd hear from the smaller communities that this is the way somebody makes a minor living or you know it's very part-time. But I would encourage Stowe to look at short-term rental regulation to, to rein in um, its, its accessible housing units for homesteading Vermonters and people who are here year-round. Would, would we have been talking about short-term rentals 10 years ago? I, was that a question for me? I didn't understand it. For anybody. No. Five years ago? So you called the Airbnb, like the technology to share. Yeah, yeah. Five years ago, it was around. And today it's a dominant or a, today a is big factor. Around the ski areas, it's the idea that someone is has purchased a property specifically for renting it on through online travel agencies. That might have taken the place of timeshares or other ski areas, but the short-term rental concentration is is in the Mad River Valley, the Stowe area, and, you know, Burlington. And Burlington has now changed its laws and significantly reduced its number of short-term rentals. 
It's in more places than the ones you mentioned. Bradford. I think the only thing that I would uh, say on that topic is that sure. there are, what we see is there are a lot of residents in our town that are supplementing their incomes to pay their taxes with short-term rentals. And I think the challenge that we have is that a lot of, we don't want to penalize yeah. those people. Yeah. And at the same time, we have out-of-state residents that are making money on our houses and using that. And so that does become a state policy issue because can local ordinances, you know, discriminate against in-state and out-of-state people yeah. when you're thinking about, um, you know, short-term rentals? I'm not, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, it's just yeah. it, that's what's been brought to my Yes. Mind. The answer is yes. Owner-occupied short-term rentals are, are usually automatically excluded. And there's many places that you occupy it during the summer if you live in the south or during the winter if you ski and you rent it the rest of the time um, but what would Stowe do if we shut down all the short-term rentals where you'd either lose vacation trade or in skiers or we'd have to build motels because you depend on tourism for a good part of your economy, then you better find a place to put the tourists. Short-term rentals filling that void right now. Um, and I, I don't think we like motels dotting our landscape either. So something we want to talk about. It's an athletic park. And, uh, you have to consider all the revenues associated with short-term rentals, short -term rentals. Not just the economic activity, but it's also the tax revenue that the state gets from the Maroons Meals Tax. Uh, people are occupying those. And then balancing that against, well, what is it going to have the intended effect is, is, is a challenge, but we it's an analysis that needs to be done. Yes. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, I'll, try, I'll try, to go through these, try to go through these quickly. This is, I would say there's a, um, a lot of uh, feelings around, around what's currently happening. So I wanted to provide a perspective of Elmore and Morristown as well. And so Elmore and Morristown, um, the way that this is playing out, uh, this district was slated to be a beneficiary of Act 127. And our warrant budget, which had a 7% spending increase, which by the calculations of the data that was provided by the state is 98 out of 122 districts in the state were spending. And so a very modest increase in spending, <coughs> yet, under current law, we'll see an 18% property tax increase in Morristown and a 25% property increase in Elmore. So if you look at the, the next slide, this is if the cap is removed with a 97.75 yield, then Morristown will have an 11% increase in the property tax and a 17% increase in Elmore. So what this means for us is that there's high probability um, unfortunately, that we're looking at a potential vote that, that may go down because of uh, the yield and how that's playing out for our taxpayers. And if that happens, I can tell you, we do not have anywhere to cut in Morristown. And it would be very, very difficult for us to reduce positions without it having a very significant impact on kids. Okay. In your last year's budget, yep. you faced, did you include the ESSER funds? In which budget? Uh, Morristown? Uh, last year, yes, we did. Okay, yeah, we so integrated your, those your, local your base going up. Not all of them, but we did. We did. Okay. I think we put. So in. this year, your base going up. You're counting in your base last year what were one-time federal funds, and if that's your base and you're only going up seven percent over that, you're not counting. The revenue for last year, you're counting that like it's there, and it's not. The, I don't know what you got, twenty, thirty thousand dollars ten thousand $10,000 for ESSER. If that's in your base, and this year your spending is going up 7% over that base, you're, you're still asking the voters to assume the cost of those ESSER funds, which have subtracted those out of the base. Uh, we reduced the classroom teacher last year to put ESSER funds, and to put ESSER-funded interventionists into our local budget. Okay. Uh, we've also made some other reductions, and I think it, overall it balanced out with what we put into our budget for next year. So I I, um, I, I looked at the seven percent increase year over year spending. We had a three and a half. We had a three and a half percent increase last year, 
in FY24. Yeah. The year before that, we had 1% increase in our budget. Yeah. And, and so, yep, yeah, um, 7% this year. And that used to be a crisis, but on average, it's going up yeah. 15. So, I uh, I understand that a lot of your numbers are based on that 9775 yield, yeah. and that yield is a very complex calculation that's still evolving. Yeah. And my, what I've asked before, Julia Richter, when she was before us, is if uh, school budgets, a lot of them, school districts, take the opportunity to rewarm their budget with some cuts, which I'm already seeing that occur in a variety of mm -hmm. places, that will reduce that overall spending estimate, which should improve the yield, while simultaneously, I think the conversation is going to shift after H50, 850 goes through. Um, to other revenue sources that could also buy up that yield or buy down our, our rates. So that uh, all I want to say is I, I make no promises, but I, I will say the legislature is very focused on this and seeing these percentage increases for districts like so is the next conversation that needs to affect that. I yield. think the impact of a 20% increase would be devastating to some communities and that's going to hit the communities that cut their budgets this year. Um, and I don't, I don't feel I can be part of allowing people to be forced out of their homes by property tax rates. So I think we're going to have to find something to do. But across the hall, they're on an austerity budget, and I asked them for ten thousand dollars for a marketing campaign for medical care advantage counter detailing, but they looked at me like I was crazy. Um, we need. We're going to have, yeah, it's, it's very tough here. And I think that's part of what's rubbing is that state government is living at, at an almost zero increase. We've got human services wants a 2.9% increase, and it's doubtful they'll get it. And the schools are coming in at a 15% increase, and that rubs in some places. Uh, because there's a lot of painful decisions we need to make here. So, but. And can I? Yes. Can I ask this? I just, because I, I actually just don't want to misspeak when I, when I speak outside of the legislature. If we did increase any types of sales taxes, those would be implemented in time to provide some relief in the gap between what schools are spending and what we're asking property tax payers to pay. And that some of that would go to the general fund. So are, is it okay to be telling people that yeah, after we pass this bill, we'll be looking at revenue proposals to close the gap? But we have some limitations on, we have to stay in the streamlined sales tax definitions. The one place we've had it, is we tax bills over a hundred dollars ski area look like that but um we've done that before we have candy and soda or something on the wall none of them are going to make anywhere near 120 million dollars they're a drop in the bucket compared to the need to get these under control um we're looking at second home taxes but the tax department says they can't break them out I don't know why, but I don't think that the commissioner supports tax increases because uh, his boss doesn't. Um, so getting getting a revenue increase this year will be difficult. I'll I'll stop talking after this, but I I mean I seem to recall something like forty million dollars for for candy and soda, et cetera. I could be wrong. There's there's software. Um, if you take those and add in a tax on second homes that we believe we can implement a year from now and use the reserves, my sense is that gets us pretty close to 120 million. But I will stop talking now. I just I just want to indicate to communities that we're trying to look at other forms of relief. Okay. Uh, this is the tax committee, so I'm not opposed to talking about taxes and revenues. I, I will just say, though, as a, as a Vermonter and just as a senator at large, we also need to look at spending. And uh, when I see these reports about the number of staff relative to a number of pupils in Vermont and the 
you are second in the nation. This other one, we are by far uh, the first in the nation. I think we need to look at policies and practices that are driving up our staffing in schools. I am not saying we don't need every single staff person in our schools. I'm saying that maybe we have more efficient, better ways. I think you alluded to some of those, that if we want to get at the root of this, we can't neglect the spending conversation. And maybe that's in a different committee, an education no, committee, is, but it just has to be part of this because we can't revenue our way out of this. We can't. I mean, spending is going to have to come down. Uh, Which your next slide really speaks yeah. to, and I love your next slide, because the bill that Julia Richter has. And, uh, proportionally, this is just phenomenal. I love what you've done here. Thank you. So this, um, I, I can't take credit for this. This was, this was shared uh, by one of our community members, but it really shows how the people changes are taking place across the state and where the, where the additional funding is going so that the public can really see this in a clear manner. The width of the bars uh, is the size of the district um, and the height is the increase uh, or the change in equalized pupils. So if I may, so Julie Richter had that great slide last week, which had the dots, which showed a third of the school districts were, were ultimately losing yeah. and then two thirds gaining. This is still that, but just proportionally, those third of the school districts represent a much larger number of actual pupils, of equalized pupils. So no, that's not what uh, Julie is saying over here. Okay. But, but I'm Julie's saying, here to keep us on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is this just really reflects and my biggest concern with Act 127 is that everybody on the left hand side has two choices to raise taxes a lot or to cut spending a lot. Yeah. And that's just to, to equalize things. So they're really probably not going to pass those budgets. So the revenues are going to go down, whereas everybody on the right, they're going to increase spending. So I'm seeing revenue declining and spending going up with Act 127, yeah. which puts greater pressure on the whole system, was, which is this 850 is not a fix. It's a patch for this year. It is, we well, no, it's just. It is not a patch. It's just saying that this is what the rules are this year. We can't cap 15% spending increase at 5% and not go bankrupt within a month. Uh, if, if your spending is at the normal 3 to 4%, 5 was fine. It was a good cap. just said you couldn't go up more than 5% for five years. We're capping that, so it's not all going to hit at once. The, the impact of 127 is going to phase in over five years. But that's not what's driving the spending. We've heard the things that are driving the spending. And yes, and we put them all into very small school districts. It, it gets real expensive. And so I can you go on to the next slide? Um, I want to thank, thank you for saying that, because that's the piece that I haven't heard said publicly yet which is there's two factors to this equation, right? There's the 5% cap, and then there's also the excessive spending. And the spending increases, both of those things need to be addressed. If only one of them is addressed, it's not going to it's not going to address the problem. And then we go into next year and the year after and the year after and the year after. Well, we have a new base, and, and I'm concerned that if it becomes too expensive for the middle class to live here, that Vermont is going to become a theme park where the rich can live and the rest can visit to see how it used to be. And we walk that line regularly, but I'm, I'm concerned about what's happening. And my increase is, or my um, main point is what he just said, Senator Cummings, which is the base. Because if, if the vote goes through with 850, we have a new base. And that base is going to be what it's built off the year after year after year. And that's where my biggest concern is right now for the state of Vermont and our overall spending is that once these budgets go through, there's no pulling them back. And then we have and then we have this to, to deal with for you know for however many years until we can't pull them back. We can not fund them, which has been done, but at a much lesser it was like we didn't give you two percent of the money that we wanted. Um, but yeah, saying we're not going to give you ten percent of the money that we want. Feel like. Sorry, I've been talking too much with you on this long share. Um, I would just say this. I in South Burlington, I served on the city council the last eight years, nine years going back, and I've seen school budgets fail with six percent, five percent, three percent. I don't think the voters are going to sustain this, which which really means on that previous graph, we're not going to get the revenue to compensate for the spending in those communities that are benefiting from this. So I, I just I see more problems on the horizon. Yeah, and that's that's the modeling that I think is is so critical. And if you look at this list, 
you can see, if you just go back real quick, if you look at that list, you can see that some districts have, have a 50% increase or in the 40s, 30s, and 40s. And so all I would ask is to really think about is this, are these spending increases a result of the 5% cap or are they a result of the new youth weights? And my guess is, and that's maybe something that Julia can answer, but this piece here, my guess is that it's driven mostly by the people weights and it's also, obviously, it's also driven by the cap. And if both of those aren't addressed, then we have our new base, um, which is, you know, I was always taught to never never identify a bunch of problems and then not identify some sort of a solution. And so the solution that I would ask you to consider and discuss, obviously, it's it's like Mark Tucker said, beyond my pay grade to know the, the, uh, the full analysis around this. But what I would suggest is to think about the education spending cap and why it works. And some of the arguments that I heard in the last meeting were that it won't allow lower spending districts to catch up. And what I would say is that if you look at the spending that's happening right now, there is not a lot of catching up that would be needed. A lot of the districts that are benefiting from Act 127 are, are already spending far more than other districts and per pupil. And so the catch-up is already there. There is no, and if you look at uh, it being potentially against the Brigham decision, I think Senator Cummings addressed that one when she said that was that was addressed with the grand list being taken out of the equation with Act 60. And then the last one that I heard was that it might incentivize districts to spend up to the cap, as was as happened in Act 127 with a five percent cap. And the difference here is. The 5% cap that's currently in place, districts did not have any repercussions for spending above the cap. And that was, so it was a cap on the tax rate, not a cap on spending. So well, it's a very different, ten. yeah, in the 10, what you saw there is that everyone, my guess, I haven't seen the data, but a lot of people went up to 9.9, .9, right? And that's so right. people's behavior is that they'll go up to 9.9%, they'll spend the max, to get the most resources. And we know with all the needs that we have in our schools, people are trying to get as many resources as they can. But I've heard this, you've got all those statistics, but if in your last year's base are the ESSER funds, then to cap at 10, you've, you're really not, you, you're not going up seven, you're really going up something like 14 because you've got, Several tens of thousands of dollars in ESSER funds in that earlier base. So if we went back to the before ESSER funds base yeah. and capped it, yeah. yeah. but yeah. for yeah. schools, good. Yeah. If we could go two more slides forward, I'll just go to the modeling. And so I, I put some modeling together just so that you could see how this plays out. So for Stowe, Stowe's at a 9% tax increase. And so the cap would really be irrelevant for us. Yeah. What would happen with the cap is that it would most likely increase the yield. The yield would be beneficial to everyone across the state if it went up because tax rate would go down. So it wouldn't impact us. If you look at the next slide, um, sorry, that's the that's the slide that I um, wanted to show you. So the, the so cap, it wouldn't come into play because we're at a 9% spending increase. And then Nine next year. the last year in which we had Esther money. So if you take out the ESSER money, that was one-time grant money, then you're going to be up a lot higher than 9%. Are you saying ESSER money that we put into last year's local budget? Yeah. If, if it's your 9% counting that ESSER is no, over not. last year. No, it's not. the 9% doesn't include ESSER funds because it's built off of our local base. The ESSER was an addition to our local base. Okay. That was grant, th those are federal dollars. That, there's yeah, some that documentation that. floating around here that schools are counting the ESSER funds on their base. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how that would be. Um, I don't, that, that's not in our base, but. Okay. Um, and so, you know, what, what would most likely happen here is that we'd have 9% and then we'd go back to our 5% increase because of tax pressure. We're not most likely going to increase our, our spending by 10% next year. And so we would see most likely a reversion back to the typical spending increases we've seen across the state. 
Um, if you look at the next slide, which is Winooski, um, and I chose Winooski as sensitively because number one, you see that it's an outlier. It's also a district that we know has significant needs and needs to be thought of carefully when we're thinking about spending decisions across the state. And so with, with Winooski, what would happen here is that if they were held to a 10% cap, they're currently projecting a spending increase of 41%. So what that would mean is that their spending would decrease by about uh, $6 million. And so this would be where you would face the biggest pushback on a, on a spending cap is when you think about reductions that would have to be made. And so what I would say in a situation like this is that there may wanna be some language that would say there's a, a spending review similar to what was in the current bill for a district that needed those funds and that there was categorical aid that was connected to accountability measures that showed that the dollars were being put in the right place. What I think is uh, challenging for a lot of people right now is that we're being asked to pull out dollars that were put into capital improvement or repairs, yet there are districts that are seeing a big influx of dollars that are putting those dollars towards capital improvements that are not going to be asked to cut down on their spending. So that, you know, as far as equity and as far as fairness across the state, I think that's where people feel like H850 is not a fair bill uh, when asking to reduce spending. The next slide looks at Barry. And so Barry was also, um, you know, in theory, which, which was in an email today, was supposed to be a district that was a true beneficiary of this. And what has happened in reality is that Barry actually lost 3% of their funds. And so when that plays out, you can see that they have a 10% increase in their spending this year, and they have a significant tax uh, increase. And if there was a cap, that would essentially just uh, level out where they're at currently right now. And so a town like Barry hasn't been able to raise their funding, um, you know, Barry has a very they, hard time passing the tax. Yeah. Last year, they that went down because they didn't spend enough, which was very rare. Uh, and it went through the second time, but they definitely. And Barry City, on its own, would have seen a big increase, but it's merged with Barry yeah. Town, which is wealthier. And nobody's rural. I want to take a look at that rural thing, but... You're proposing the legislature put a 10% cap in. Would you also concede that the voters who are going to be voting on these budgets could enact those same percent, those same controls by voting down their budgets? And isn't this in the spirit of local control that these voters are going to vote on these budgets? And if they vote no, that's the cap? It's a, I mean, it's an interesting question because I think that there are local voters that are benefiting so much from the increase in weights that they're not gonna vote that budget down and they'll still be receiving a lot of additional funds. And so you're not addressing the spending in those districts, which I think is probably 50% of the spending increases that we've seen across the state. And so yes, could they vote the budget down? Yes, but the other people that are gonna vote the budget down are the people operating on a very slim margin right now that don't have a lot to cut. And because the yield is where it's at, a town like Morristown, if they vote down their budget, which is very likely they voted down their town budget, if they vote down the school budget, then we're in a situation where we don't have anything to cut because of the yield and because of the spending across the state. And so unless, unless that's addressed, we're putting so many towns into a situation where they're going into town meeting day and potentially having their budgets voted down with their electorate coming to them and saying, cut more. And the reason, you know, a lot of them have nowhere to cut. And so if you're asking these towns to reduce their budgets more because of the tax increase that is seen by all districts across the state, that, that doesn't seem like the right solution at this time. I, I am not opposed to capping spending if we're going to do that. I just think realistically to put that into the conversation, this budgetary cycle is is going to be politically impossible. Um, but I think for next year, I, I'm not opposed to that. I, I also, I've heard the governor say, and I'm curious if you have a reaction to staffing ratio minimums, or penalties if they, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on starting to look at how many adults we have in the classroom and either penalizing districts through the formula? Um, did they reach a certain too low of a threshold? I think 
you know, in the spirit of local control, I think in the spirit of a collective education fund, a spending cap would still give districts a lot of autonomy in how they spend their money. And so you're, you're essentially doing that without doing that. If you say you only have this much to increase, but your class sizes, you have three, four students in a class, you're naturally going to have to look at that and say, this doesn't make sense. And we're already reaching the spending cap. So we're going to have to make some reductions. Where should we reduce and to not you know, negatively impact our students? And class size would, would be a discussion that would come up in this. But how is that different? If we just say, you've already told us that you yeah. cannot spend less than the 24%, whatever, any of you are increasing. You can't do, but if we set a 10% cap, you could. Or, but if you, the voters voted it down, you could. So, or you couldn't because you wouldn't. So I'm trying to figure out capping would do a lot to remove local control. Um, but so is it the size of the school had a lot to do with the size, you know, economies of scale. You know, you've got a French teacher that teaches 30 kids or 300 kids or 100 kids. Pay the teacher the same. We're not getting economies of scale with our very small rural schools. And some of them, I mean, in most states, we'd have three campuses on this state maybe four, and they would go K-12 and maybe pre-K-12, and you put all your kids in them, and we're local. I love small local schools. My kids all went to Mark Kinney's, which are big in comparison. But I've got to be able to afford to send them there. And we're we're coming up against a wall on this one. I don't even know if we can afford a 10% increase in here. When you consider that we used to go up 3 to 4% a long time ago, like four years. Uh, so five years, I guess. That's where the numbers came for that. School spending, 19 and before. So I don't know. I think my um, my final slide is just, you know, as a summary, and, and this conversation, I think, highlights the complexity of the discussion, and what I'm most concerned about is that there's a major policy decision that's being made in such a rapid manner, and we've learned that there can be significant unintended consequences to these policy decisions, and as this decision is made and pushed through, what are the consequences that are, that are happening right now? And what will that look like in one year and three years and five years when we have this new base that goes through? So I just, you know, I just ask that um, the Senate consider that before you vote. The waiting was publicly done. I had some of my schools tell me to vote for it. I knew I spent a lot of time on the phone because I knew Barry thought they were going to really win and the statistics said, no, they were going to hold even at best. Um, trying to understand that. And, but I think what happened is when the numbers finally got run, there were bigger changes that people expected. But schools got hit with all the things they got hit with this year. And, I can see where it's aggravating some schools, but the waiting was supported as a good thing to do. It's just for equity. I, mean, I don't think we should be paying schools extra to educate low-income kids that they don't have there anymore. Um, so, and I, yeah, you at Marsville would be a winner, right, in the waiting? Well, in reality, uh, not really. I mean, no. the way that it's playing out for us, we're reducing positions. And if if the property tax increases result in a, a failed budget, then we're going to be reducing even more. And so an act that was targeting equity is, in my eyes, not helping the districts and the students that need it the most right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
I did not want How do you to define the districts that needed most students? Well, I can tell you in Marshall, we have significant needs. We have students that are struggling. We have all the factors that I identified earlier. Um, yeah, I would invite you to come to our school and talk to our teachers and, you know, engage in that discussion. When you say that, how do you measure? You, you concluded that there are schools that need it most. Yeah. What are the measures you use to come to that conclusion? I think that the, that's a complex question, and, that, and there was a lot of research that has been done, and, and the weighting study that was done was very in-depth, and it was a very good problem. I think it was also done in 2019, and so it was done with data that has changed significantly as we've navigated a pandemic, as we've seen the rise in mental health challenges with our children. These are realities that we're facing right now, and the data is, it's old data that this was modeled on. And so we're in a rapidly changing environment. And I just ask that that be considered as, as these major policy decisions are being made. So, so I was here two years ago when this was being considered like 1.7, whatever it was called then. And I was on Senate Education. And uh, we put a testimony, and I'm, I'm Googling it right now from this one's from Sue Soglowski, Executive Director of Vermont School Boards mm -hmm. Association. As well as superintendents came before us, the principals association. I recall every single one of them full throated support of what we did with this. So I, I get where you're coming from, and this is working sadly as it is intended. Um, Act 127 with the pupil weight changes, absent the 5% cap, which is being corrected. Um, and that intention is, is I think, um, creating a lot of this frustration for districts like so. I, I encourage you to continue to advocate and express to, to your representative bodies, the superintendents association, the principals association, school boards uh, association, as well as uh, the NEA and so on, uh, to speak with clarity as to where you would like to go from here and how to adjust in, in the years coming forward. Because I don't think we fixed it without H2850. And I, I think your voice is, is very sound. I think it will be amplified if you get your, your representative bodies to, to stand with you on, on these changes that you're advocating for. Here. I appreciate that. I'm going to have to start wrapping this up because I'd like to have Emily to be able to answer some questions for us. I'd like to give us a break, but natural resources is leaving at 4.30, which means I don't have a form. So um, I'm going to kind of push it through, and we will uh, keep going on this until we can figure out what's going on. Okay. Any last questions? I'm not sure where to start. Somehow, schools can't cut their budgets this year, but if we put a 10% cap on them, they can do that. And I'm having trouble reconciling that. Having trouble. If we were seriously entertaining the idea of putting a 10% cap in school budgets, then we would also need to revisit the provision in 850 uh, that, that only pays for them if they reward the budgets, because then I think that would effectively, if I recall correctly, force more, force more school districts to redo the budgets, which might increase the 500000 allocation. Yeah, I don't think putting a 10% cap on this year is, is going to, I mean, it, the schools are telling us they can't reduce any more this year. So we're saying we're going to put a 10% cap on you. And again, it depends on where the 10% starts. If what was in place the last year, and there's at least some papers floating around that says that some schools are counting the ESSER funds in their base last year. So they're going 10% up because they need to keep the teachers that are, they paid for interventionists of whatever they did because the need is. So 
Julia, anything off the top of your head that really is out there that I know it's just a lot to absorb to it. Yeah. It certainly is a lot to, uh, for the record, I'm Julia Richter with the Joint Fiscal Office. Certainly a lot to absorb um, with respect to the proposal to cap education spending. Um, of course, that's a policy decision as to if it's feasible or not this coming year. I don't know. This year. Um, you said this coming year. I would interpret that as next year. Next year. Like, well, I think, oh, for fiscal year, you're thinking fiscal year 26? The crisis is this year. Yeah. I mean, once this year goes, you're at a new base. And if we capped it, though, that would have the effect of only allowing Winooski. I mean, the reason the schools with a huge increase in English language, Winooski, I think, is a poster child. Uh, the reason the House wanted to give them their money this year is that they've been carrying this burden for a number of years without any state assistance, so very little. So if we cut them at 10%, we're really undoing the intent of 127, which was to help them. I like the phasing it in. So it's like you said that the barn, the horse is the barn. So my previous one forced them to reward their budget. So a lot of districts would probably fall on that and increase in that five hundred thousand dollar appropriation. But they can do it now. I mean, they're telling us they can't. And yet if we make them, they can't. And I'm confused by that. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Um I I do not have intimate knowledge in the school district budgeting process. I'm really um, looking at it from the state picture. Um, thinking about it from the overall state picture, I do think it's important to come back to, so timing is one question. Another question that um, I think is important keeping in mind is when thinking about um, comparing year over year spending, how that comparison is made. Or is it solely looking at change in education spending? Or is it looking at change in education spending per pupil? Um, or is it looking at change in education spending per weighted pupil? Um, the, the information that was just presented was looking at changes in education spending from one year to the next without factoring in changes in the Act 27 weighting changes. Um, and it seems as though that modeling has also been conducted using actual pupil counts instead of um, including pupil weights. So I think that there's an important nuance to when considering policy decisions of when comparing education spending, if that were to be a policy route you would be considering, um, thinking about what is the right metric in terms of comparing spending decisions by school district. And I think here we're kind of at the most of the schools to tell us. Uh, I've seen some for people spending numbers in here, but I'm not sure where they're coming from. Um, and part of me feels like we're just putting a band on what is a systemic problem is that we're very small and it costs a lot to educate a few kids in their small schools. We don't have the test scores that says we're doing a whole lot better than or any better than kids that are educated in beat schools. So I, I'm not sure we need to spend. I think it's going to be a longer discussion than this year's budget. I just can't see the 18 percent, 20 percent increase in property taxes being sustainable. People, I'm wondering about the few young people that may have been able to buy a home, they're heavily mortgaged, they have, you know, no equity, and all their money's going into their property tax. If they're spending, they're paying based on their income. Well, we have numbers, if 20% goes through, what will happen to people paying on income? I know it'll go up. It'll go up 20%. It will be a, it will be a policy decision in terms of how the yields are set. Um, 
given the current modeling I've been asked to do, it is going up in accordance with Homestead. So the income yield is calculated to see an average increase in income bills of 20%. However, um, this also gets back to what I briefly touched on um, during the caucus today, for those of you that were there, um, with respect to the property tax credit lag. So because of that lag, um, uh, the way that the property tax credit is calculated is it's looking at the prior year, how much it would be if you were to pay on income, how much it were to be if you were to pay on property. If you if it were to be left to pay on income, then you are credited that difference to make you whole so that you're paying on income on the next year's bill. So when looking at FY25, an increase in property tax bills of 20%, that means that that property tax credit that folks are seeing on their property tax bills is not reflecting FY25 liability for income. It's reflecting FY24 liability for income. So there's an even, um, because of that lag, there will be a maybe a more significant impact on some folks who are paying on income because they won't see the, the larger property tax credit uh, until their property tax bill in FY26. So there's one one year lag before you get it? Until you get um, the, the, the proportional help to the bill. So they're going to get really, they're going to get hit more this year because of this done last year. Okay, so... We're, yeah, we're still going to see income. Really yeah, got I got a yeah. Correct. And so, if you were to solve, if you were to ask me to solve for the income yield, so it'd be the same average bill change as Homestead. That that's what what you have done yeah. over time. However, because of the lag that. Property tax credit won't show up until FY26. Okay, but if I go to tax sale this year, it's not going to help me. Rob, take that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Tucker has his Oh, Mr. Tucker, welcome. Hi, I've been sitting here listening to um, Superintendent uh, Harry's testimony. Um, trying to think of a way to say this without sounding like I'm going after one of my colleagues but a couple things that I, I think I really think that it's inappropriate and incorrect to blame everybody's property tax increases on act one, uh, on act 127 so I I serve a supervisory union with five districts all of which to one degree or another large degree or small degree benefited from the changes in the people waiting formula um, even one of my districts is Peachum, which is a lot of people will consider that to be we would consider that to be a relatively affluent community in, in the Northeast Kingdom, even though the income sensitivity rate in Peachum is around 70%. Um, but even Peachum benefited from an increase in uh, in the long-term weighted ADM from last year to this year. I have another district that um Saw so almost a, a roughly a 90, 90 people increase from last year to this year. So they should have benefited greatly. Um, but the thing that I would say that it, it's a bit of an overgeneralization, but all the benefits for the most part that we expected to uh, to see from improvements to the uh, to our pupil counts from the waiting formula change got wiped out by inflation. Okay. And for for a great, to a great degree, what we are seeing it, for increases in our homestead tax rates are a result of CLA. The two things are not related together or not connected together. They're two separate factors. And, you know, with all due respect to uh, to my colleague in Stowe, you know, when they're when you're talking about a community that has a homestead tax rate of $1.30, um, you know, my typical district out here has been cycling hovering around a dollar sixty or more every year for as long as I've been superintendent. So it's uh you know when you look at any any individual communities increase, you know, when you talk about the formerly advantaged communities that are now losing pupils because of the adjustment to the pupil weights, 
yes, they are going to see and uh, they're going to see an increase in the homestead uh, tax rate because of that to a certain degree, but it's not just because of that. And I would just respectfully remind this committee that the whole purpose of 127 was to make was to conduct a balancing act within a closed system. Because 127 did not by itself bring more revenue into the education fund. It just changed the formula for distributing it. So yes, there are districts like mine that benefited or should have and we should have benefited more from that. And but the only way that that works is if other districts lost out some way. And that's and we talked about this for years as a, you know, from the time that the waiting study was first released. That was the first thing that I heard people say. It's like, whoa, somebody's gonna lose pupils because of this. And we were sitting here saying we're gonna we're gonna gain pupils. So you know, it's been something like 27 years since uh, Act 60 was enacted. And the districts out here in the Northeast Kingdom, the rural districts in Vermont, have suffered all of these years under a poorly implemented funding formula based on a very um, ham-handed uh, creation of pupil weights. And, you know, this is not the right time. It, it would be eminently unfair to throw out, uh, as I've heard of people suggest, throw out Act 127 before we before it's hit the ground and started running. So, um, you know, there's a lot there's a lot more to this. I think Stowe's CLA rates this year is something like at around 50 points. So they have a very low CLA rate. Um, there's a lot of factors involved here, and it's just you know. And I heard a couple of comments throughout the testimony about well, Act 127 did this, Act 127 did that. It didn't do all of this. No. I think we know. I think it's hard for towns that are having to make decisions they don't want to make, seeing somebody else get more spending capacity. I haven't heard that Winooski's tax rate is going up 40%. But, uh, yeah. And, and if I could, the, more typical. the last point that I'll make, and then I'm going to shut up because I, I have to go home, um, is that when when you talk about small uh, disadvantaged formerly disadvantaged communities and smaller schools getting more resources, and you start to question whether we're applying those resources effectively for the benefit of our students, I think what the real question should be to look at what our students are doing when they come out of our system. <laughs> and are they being successful? Because I think there's a a uh, pejorative sense that the small schools can't do it as well as larger schools. And I, I will argue against that point until the cows come home, to use an old Vermont expression, because we have very successful outcomes with our students in our small schools with working in a very resource-constrained environment, you know, at relatively high tax rates compared to some of our, the wealthier communities in Vermont. So um, I just... You know, I'm, I'm offended when people say, well, the small schools don't give opportunities to students. We find ways to do it, and we've done it for years with less resources than some other communities. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. I Amen. Have... I just appreciate what Mr. Tucker said. I, I just am glad that, that he's here to provide some counterbalance and it is a really tough conversation. We're not going to make every district happy, but it's important to remember why we did this in the first place. Yes. Okay. I have a feeling that we have reached absorption capacity here. <laughs> and we will probably do better. We had a pretty heavy afternoon. Um, giving ourselves a break. We'll give about 15 minutes before natural resources has to go back into committee. And we will continue to work on this. I wish I could find an easy answer, but I'm not so far. Except I mean, the world and all the school. And everything is good. Nixon. I was trying to be as 